after what? Anybody know? Three. All right. Last class, we pretty much talked. We talked and talked, which is pretty much what you do in a lecture type class. <clears throat> but um, I'd like to read some from my notes to, to uh, recover. I've only read a little bit so far, but I'd like to recover a little bit um, um, and then read on to help us begin to <clears throat> formulate what these seven churches were going through, why the Lord wrote to them, and um, what the message of the book is going to be all about. <clears throat> so if you don't mind, I'll just uh, start by reading a few here. The book begins with a series of messages from Jesus to seven, the seven churches of Asia Minor. From the specific information given in Jesus' messages to each church, we might surmise that these Christians were beset with problems and discouraged. When taken as a whole, these seven churches are shown to have many faults that needed correcting and were assaulted by a variety of outward enemies. <clears throat> I'm rereading something that I've read to you before right here, this part, and the, what I just read in a little bit here. Remember, the church as founded by Jesus himself had been in existence for just short of a century. One would think that by that amount of time, the worldwide church would have been walking in victory and showing forth the glory of our Lord Jesus' resurrection. <clears throat> Instead, the people of God were small in number, in a weakened state, and the condition of things in their lives had reached a tipping point where all seemed virtually out of control due to daily trials and problems. These churches were in the midst of persecution from the Romans, and they actually were major uh, persecution from the Romans. They were being you know, uh, fed to the lions and all sorts of stuff. So if you could imagine the brand new, Jesus-loving, alive, first bunch of people on the planet to ever have Jesus in them and to f walk in all of that stuff, they are in the middle of a worldwide persecution. And not only is it the Roman persecution going on, but by this time, the Jews, their own family, their own friends, their own work, people they work with have, have turned their back on them and won't even allow them to go to the, the temple or any of that kind of stuff. They're totally rejected. Uh, they're totally rejected so you could say they are rejects in the eyes of people. Okay, anybody ever been a reject in the eyes of anybody? <coughs> yeah. I haven't, but I've heard tell. Um, and um, so, um, uh, so this is a new part that I didn't read. Um, small, poor, needy, suffering, persecuted by the synagogue, struggling to exist as a church, fighting division. John wrote this letter as an attempt to give them answers. Okay, that was it. I just told you for the first time. <laughs> Why John wrote this, the purpose in his writing. Small, poor, needy, suffering, persecuted by the synagogue, struggling to exist as a church, fighting divisions. John wrote this letter in an attempt to give them answers to what they were experiencing. For many believers in these churches, you could say that since following Christ, things had turned out harder than they initially imagined. It was because of this inner turmoil that precipitated the Lord to address these churches through his servant John. Notice how Jesus directs his concerns not only to the outward inequities and oppressions and know for sure and that's what, these, that's what the, we're going to get into in this letter. Incredible outward inequities and, and uh, 
oppressions put on them by others, but also their internal lack of, uh, and spiritual state on their part. Though the specific issues were different than ours today, yet there's a common denominator in theirs and our struggles. In every generation there lies the struggle between forces that are more powerful than we, this is true of churches and for individuals, believers alike. All right, so I'm, I'm getting ready for class tonight and I'm, um, and so we eat around five o'clock. So Deb and I turn on the news and we watch the news, okay? And um, I should have written it all down so I could relate it to you. But uh, let's see, the airlines are um, finding new ways to charge you. Uh, they are going to charge you that if you want a seat by somebody that you would like to sit by instead of somebody you won't, they'll actually do this little thing, and I'm not going to explain that. San Francisco is working on charging tens, a 10 cent tax per mile on miles driven. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. Whooping cough has made new uh, making a new comeback, and they're calling it in epidemic form in, the, uh, in this country. Okay, pertussis, whatever you're, the, you're used to calling it. <clears throat> um, but it's moving into epidemic proportions. Uh, West Nile disease, just in our area, another person died today from being bit by a mosquito. <clears throat> um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the government ones, but you should be well familiar with all the government oppressions and stuff that they're tucking on to you. So, well, I'm, I'm actually talking about things that are bringing to bear on us. Uh, the corn crop is lost uh, so bad that they're gonna have to charge you more. Um, did you have one? There was a minister holding Bible study in his house. He was arrested. Okay. Minister holding Bible study in his house was arrested. So, and what I'm kind of getting at here, folks, is um, do you ever feel like you're, you know, just caught in the middle of a bunch of stuff, that there are greedy people and powerful people who are at work controlling your lives and your money and doing all this stuff and putting demands and then putting more demands and then putting more demands? Uh, oh, yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> the fires out in the West. Um, that there's some sort of a thing where they, one reason why the fires are bigger, hotter, and destroying more stuff is that the uh, park rangers used to allow uh, for uh, either lightning strikes to burn and burn itself out or to, uh, what is it, when you start the fire and a controlled burn, controlled burn, and they said, they can't hardly do that anymore because people are living everywhere and their first response uh, is, to do, is to do that. And that when it would naturally come, it would burn off all the stuff that would burn easier and stuff like that. And so now it's just building up because all these people are moving in. They can't do anything about it. So when a fire starts in there, it's, it's a mega, they're calling them mega fires, and they burn so hot and, and because there's so much stuff to burn, <clears throat> that um, um, that the fireman's first responsibility is no longer to put out the fire, but to put all their energy where the fire's going towards someone's houses. So it's like he and the guy said, basically we are responsible for these mega fires because of where we're moving and how many people are in the areas and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, he said, we can't even do controlled burns anymore because if you do and, and it gets out of control and burns somebody's house, then you get sued. All right. <clears throat> so there's all this stuff. I mean, they, and they just, kept, they just kept coming. I mean, it just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And, you know, and, and uh, <clears throat> um, you realize that um, there are Stu there's stuff all around us, folks, that we just absolutely don't have any control over, and it's controlling us, and a lot of it is rich people who just want to get richer, and they're just, you know, 
Um, they were talking about American Airlines, you know, and that, okay, they're in bankruptcy and they're going under and all this to right. You've heard that story, okay? Well, today they announced that they had the biggest, most profitable, I forget how many billion that they made over the past year, stuff like that. <clears throat> well, we're, we can't afford to do this for you anymore. Um, and then we'll have to charge you for that and, you know, on and on and on. I mean, <clears throat> and you, you know, it's, um, I'm trying to think of another one that they just recently did, but um, <clears throat> it's, uh, you're going, look, I'm just wanting to fly somewhere and minister Christ, okay? <laughs> Um, you realize that there are things that are way bigger than you that have more control and that your control is getting less and less and less okay <clears throat> alright so let's read a little more throughout the book of Revelation we're given a picture of the only true powers that are at work in the world it paints a picture of the forces of darkness that stand in opposition to God and all that stand with him in this book, the opposition forces are described in terms of ferocious beasts, book of Revelation, who seek to destroy those who follow Jesus. It's, it's greater than that, and I'll explain that, but I'm just trying to introduce something here. The imagery can be applied to us today. Many of God's people feel weak and helpless because terrible forces are pressing hard against them. Where will we find hope? Just like they're saying, the, you know, um, when I was when I was young, uh, my parents, my my stepfather and my mother were both alcoholics. Um, they fought all the time. We were poor because they blew all their money on alcohol and stuff like that, and you know whatever else that led to that, you know, smoking and everything else. And um, uh, and as a child. You know, I, you know, I've told this a few times, but I remember as a child laying there in my bed and crying and wishing, you know, it's like two o'clock in the morning and they're in the other room fighting and screaming and throwing stuff and breaking stuff. And I remember just as a little child going, you know, you know, God, help us, help them, do, you know, do something, Lord. <clears throat> and... Um, uh, I remember waiting for it to get real late or early morning when the sun would barely peek up. Then I knew that they would be asleep. And the sun would bring peace until the next go-round. And um, <clears throat> as I got older, we actually ended up being the victims of, you know, physical abuse and stuff like that, too. But I know from the core of my being what it feels like to have absolutely no control none most of you know I grew up in an orphanage how did I end up in that orphanage my mom asked me and my brothers would you rather stay here in this or live in an orphanage I said get me out of here I was 11 years old my hands would shake like that uh, I was put on Valium at, actually I was 10 when I was put on Valium I shook so bad, I could, I was always, that was one of the first things that went when I got saved, is my hand shaking. Um, but, um, you know, you're not supposed to be on Valium at that young and stuff like that, and yet <clears throat> the doctor gave me a, a lifetime prescription because he said, your nerves are shattered. He said, they're shattered. You, you'll never be able to control these again. Well, he was right. I don't control it. Jesus does that. But I, I'm only telling you all of that, not so you go, oh, I'm telling you that I understand um, complete helplessness. I understand being at the whim of uh, a beast. I understand what it means uh, to live with extreme cruelty and hurt. <clears throat> um, and when I came to Jesus, I remember that I could care less about heaven or getting out of hell because in my mind, I was already in hell. That's the way I felt. I, went, I, don't, I don't care about getting out of hell uh, in the sense of what most people think or even going to heaven. I just want something to change in my, 
You know, I want something real and something, I want some hope in this, in this stuff. This book of Revelation, it's an incredible, incredible book for that purpose. And anybody who is in some situation that is beyond them, it's just beyond them, and they don't know what to do about it. <clears throat> um, it is important to remember that seven is the number of completion. Seven days, God finished his thing, and then he rested. <clears throat> okay? uh, seven is the number of completion, and therefore seven churches is representative of all the church as a whole. This means that this letter not only applies to those specific seven churches or even to all the churches that existed during that time period, but to all the church throughout all time. Okay, that contradicts some people's teaching, and I'm not trying to contradict anybody's teaching, but it contradicts some people's teaching that the book of Revelation is absolutely not valid. It has no, nothing good for you unless you're living in the end time. So, I mean, if that was the case, why would anybody study the book of Revelation until, you know, all of a sudden some big beast stood up and went, that's him! Of course, people have been doing that for thousands of years. <laughs> so, so everybody thinks they're living in the end time. Um, uh, all right, so it is... It, it is in this book that words such as power and words such as authority are used more than any other book in the Bible. Any other. Power and authority. And there is a difference, folks. God has power and God has authority. Okay. This still may not be going the way you think it's going, though. <laughs> That's why we're still just introducing. We're not yet answering anything. Um, in it are images of overwhelming forces over which God's people have no control. And I'll, I'll prove that in just a few minutes with scripture after scripture. God's people have no control. It is a book primarily setting forth conflict between nations and powers as well as between God and spiritual wickedness of the highest sort. They are frightening and ominous and beyond even our comprehension. To read of them, talking about to read of the book of Revelation and to think that's going to happen to you. To read of them sends fear into the hearts of many because the beasts and images and forces of nature and terrifying events make us feel powerless and helpless and impotent to the point of being at the hands of irresistible forces. All right, I want to take the time because I'm building my case here. We haven't got to my case yet, but I want to take the time to prove to you that this book deals a lot with Christians who are not in control, okay, in the traditional sense. Revelation 6, <clears throat> turn there with me, Revelation 6 and verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And there went, went out another horse that had red, and power was given to him who sat on it uh, to take peace from the earth. To take peace from the earth. And that they should kill one another. And that there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat upon him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A measure of wheat for a Daenerys, and three measures of barley for a Daenerys, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. All right, so here you have the coming forth of something that is controlling the food source, and is charging you for it. Okay, now again, we're not actually talking prophetically here, but we are showing you that there are forces that you're facing right now that are doing this very thing. 
And, and again, our point is not to point out what's wrong with the world today either. We'll, we haven't got to our point. <clears throat> and when he had opened the fourth seal, and I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I, I know this one by heart, basically. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse and him that rode upon it. Let's see. And his name that sat upon it was death, and hell followed after him. And power was given him over the fourth part of the earth to kill and with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts, the beasts of the earth. Okay, now drop down to verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it had been rolled together, and every mountain, every mountain, an island was moved out of their place, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall upon us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? All right, let's go to chapter 8. <clears throat> And again, I have to read these things because you have to realize the symbolism that we're going to be dealing with when we get into this thing and what, what's really going on here. Chapter 8, beginning with verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burnt up, and all grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and there was a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the uh, creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. <clears throat> um, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven burning as though it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters and the name of the star is called wormwood and the third part of the waters became wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter and the fourth angel sounded and the, the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars so that the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound <clears throat> okay you sort of getting the idea no you're not let's go to chapter 9 <clears throat> chapter 9 verse 1 <clears throat> we'll read verse uh, 1 through 3 here and the fifth angel sounded, and I, I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth and had power. Drop down to verse, well, let's go to verse 5. And to them it was given that they should kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. To them was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion uh, when it stingeth a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men, and they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses running to battle, and they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them, who is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue was his name Apollyon, one woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Anybody thinking, that's enough woes? <laughs> Whoa, Nelly. Whoa. 
Well, Wilbur. <laughs> um, this actually goes all the way down to verse 21, this same stuff. Um, but let's go, let's go to chapter 13, because I need to give you a variety of reality. A variety of reality. <clears throat> okay, chapter 13, verse 1 through 4. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Okay, blasphemy is against who? It's against God. <clears throat> and the beast which I saw was like a leopard and his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him power and his throne, um, his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as though it was wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Um, and and uh, let's go to verse five. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemes. And power was given unto him to continue forty days and two months. Um, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him, all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth that worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Um, Let's drop down to verse 11 because it. Uh, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell in it to worship the first beast, who, whose deadly wound was healed, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles still want to see miracles <clears throat> just check it <clears throat> um, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast that had a wound by a sword and did live <clears throat> um, let's see. I mean, the, all these go on and on and on, but I, uh, let me do one more. Let's go to uh, Revelation 16. <clears throat> and we'll do one through four again, uh, beginning with, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the bowls of wrath of God upon the earth and the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth and there fell a foul and a painful sore upon the men who had the mark of the beast and upon those who worshiped his image and the second angel poured out his bowl upon the sea and became like the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea and the third angel <clears throat> poured out his bowl upon the rivers and the fountains of water, and they became blood. And then verse 8, And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the, the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and I thought that was already happening, and blasphemed the name of God who had power over the plagues, and they repented not to, to give him glory. All right, <clears throat> much more. I'm not actually reading all that I probably should, but I want to tell you something about this book. Makes tears come to my eyes. This is the most wonderful book with answers from the Lord. This book contains genuine hope. This book is filled with um, the glory of God in ways that you can't even imagine. 
I obviously didn't read all the high points of what, what that is right now. But this book is an incredible, like I said in the last class, if it were a movie just opening up, you'd want to run to come see it because this thing is just wonderful and it's woven by God. It is woven by the Lord and it's, a, it's, it's literally a tapestry. It's, I mean, it is literally a tapestry because of the way that it is written and put together. And it flows from one part to the next, but always reaffirming the truth and always moving with purpose and clarity in God and in those who can hear what the Spirit's saying to the churches and moves right on through from the first to the last until when you get through it's a book it's a tapestry it's a it's a glorious picture for the seven churches who were going through all kind of junk and for the for us today who may be going through all kind of stuff and and the 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 end result is the end result of this book is that you you will find hope and you will see how to proceed through these things. How to proceed. And it tells you, it tells you how to proceed. And so I'm just telling you um, because I, I, I want to um, I want to continue to read stuff that scares the H-E double hockey sticks out of you. <clears throat> uh, um, I want to do that for a while because I want you to, I want your minds to go to where you have always thought this was talking about. Okay? I want you to, I want you to go, oh my God, you know, uh, in the way that most people do. <clears throat> I also want you to be confronted with as high, oh, by the way, by the way, when I said it's full of glory and, and hope and everything, I'm not talking about the end. I'm telling you that this thing I'm going to hurt myself if I yeah. <laughs> calm down. <laughs> that this thing is spelling it out. By the time you get to the end, you're already <laughs> gathered around and rejoicing. You know, you're not, you know, what we call the end <laughs> is, is not it. That's not where you're going to find your hope. And so, you know, let me... Uh, let me at least try to get this. Uh, I will probably finish this little section out, and then when we start class next time, I'm going to have to take you through some more very specific scriptures and show you a pattern of, well, I'm not going to tell you right now. But it's going to be another pattern. It's not just what I just read to you was a pattern of the beast or beasts, however you want to look at it. Um, but there, there are other patterns I have to set in place. There are several things that have to be set in place before we go, let's go. Okay, and we're getting close. All right, so let me, let me try to finish some of this here. The frightful prospects found in this book will not allow us to simply read it as a story having no bearing upon us personally. This is because the overwhelming nature of the pictures painted in this book causes us to look within and ponder our own powerlessness. Meaning, if we thought these things were coming on the earth, you following? If you actually thought these things, these exact things were coming on the earth prophetically, and you considered your ability, your spiritual level or whatever, I don't even know what all the, you know, to, to um, traverse your way through it, 
you would go, oh my God. You know what I mean? You just go, just forget it. You know. And and that's what you're supposed to come to. So what I'm reading now is you considering that to, to be an actual thing, what does that do to you? Because what it does to you, when you when what we just read and more, what it does to you is going to matter a whole bunch later on. It's going to matter. Uh, so I'll really read that last sentence again. This is because the overwhelming nature of the pictures painted in this book causes us to look within and ponder our own powerlessness. As we do, we must conclude that in ourselves, we are no match for such things. Okay. All right. Let me, let me just state something here. You may not be in some horrible situation right now. I don't know if you've noticed when you've read the book of Revelation who it is that's making all this happen. But it's God. It's not the devil. We'll show it. We'll, we'll get into it. God will see to it that you're faced with over, something overwhelming at some time. Maybe you've already had, maybe you are, maybe you will. But what I'm sharing right now is worth listening to. <laughs> because if the seeds are planted, the Holy Spirit will bring them up at the right time. But it would be a little like if this really was prophetically true and, and it, you know, and someone's teaching you this. Now, we're not, and this is not the way we're approaching this, but it would be like if it was prophetically true and somebody has given you a heads up how to get through that. You wouldn't want to look up when the day happens, you know, this beast rises out of the sea and this one out of the earth and all this, and you know, you go, oh my God, how did that go? You know, um, the example I've always thought of since I was a very young Christian was the whole armor of God. And we're given the shield of faith. And he says, uh, you're given the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, this goes back to stuff we've already been saying before this, and that is the shield of faith. You know, it's not like the enemy starts firing darts and they go, poof, 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 and then you reach down and you go, where's my shield? And then you pull it up, you know, and you're holding your shield and you've already got these darts all in there. You know, you know, it's a little late to be digging around trying to get your faith back up. Uh, that's true. In your little life and mine every day, folks, we need to have that armor, and it's not some place thing. There's an act, you actually have faith. You actually have the Word of God. You actually have these things. And that shield is supposed to be in place before the enemy starts shooting. I get amen. <laughs> you know, it's like, so they, they, the shield quenches all of but most Christians, here's what they do. They go, you know, oh, la, 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 life's good. There ain't no devil. Everything's... <laughs> and then they get to their... Oh, God, all of these darts and that fire. And you know what they do? And they go, oh, Lord, save me. Right? They want him to show up, start pulling them out, going, oh, Lord, don't worry, I'll take care of you. He took care of you by giving you a shield of faith. Okay, but, but I said this to, when we were in Houston, when uh, I was about to have an altar call, and it was the, the last big altar call, and I said, you know what? You're going to come down here, and some of you are going to want me to pray for your faith. I said, but faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And if you never get in the Word of God, you're not going to have any faith. Amen? All right. 
So I, I, I see all these guys looking back and forth, knowing what always happens around here. This is a second or third confirmation of others who have taught you and much of, you know, the way it works around here is God is in control. Yeah. Or let's put it this way. Did anybody notice Greg walk up to me after my first teaching and stand here for a little while? Anybody watch? Anybody notice that? You know why he did that? He's saying, okay, here's what I taught. Now you need to say this too. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> he went, oh my God, you're teaching exactly what I taught. Now he came up to me and said the same thing. <clears throat> Folks, this is the Lord. This is the Lord. This is, God has your number. Now answer. <laughs> yeah, God has your number. Now answer the dead burn phone. <laughs> Is Doug still on there? Open the dead burn ventana. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> and so um, I felt the Holy Spirit <clears throat> stop me to say, if you, you know, and, and what I did was I pulled the mic up close and I got like this. And I did that because, oh, something, something different's happening. Maybe this is good. What? Are you kidding me, right? This does it? Really? R really? Is that, you know, <clears throat> we... We're family. We're the family of God. We're together and we're seeking the Lord. And the Lord has graced us with some things by Greg and Mallory and myself that is going to be seeds that will come out of you later on. I'm telling you, you'll, you'll, you know, when it starts coming up and you start saying stuff or moving with something you heard and you'll go, I didn't even remember I remembered that. That's what happens. You just go, I, I, I didn't even remember I remembered that. But look, it's actually coming out of me. <clears throat> and that's because seeds are real. And you may not get it in your ears, in your head right now, but you stay open to him and it'll get inside of you. Yeah, Mallory? I'm amazed regularly the things taught me when I was in Bible school over 20 years ago, and I would put it on a piece of paper and put it somewhere, and it'll pop up and it'll come to mind, and I'll start operating in it, and I would not do anything with that little bit. I would have forgotten that it was even there, and it's and I, I could think that was a seed. I didn't even know it was a seed. It, I don't even have a control over it. It's just it's coming up now, so I just wanted to testify to that. Did it happen? Real. Did you get that recorded? Oh. Well, if you didn't hear it, those that are on Skype that are all over the world, Mallory just said, Randy, you are the greatest man of God I ever saw. <laughs> it was incredible what she said. You should have heard it. <laughs> just kidding if there's somebody on there that's looking for an offense. <laughs> that was a joke. <clears throat> All right, um, let me, because we're clearly not going to fully make this, let me just double check where I'm at here and make sure that we pick this up. You know what, I'm just going to read a few of the first sentences um, that we did cover this class in my next one, and because um, we're not in a hurry. We're not in a hurry. We want to hear from the Lord. Amen. So open your hearts as we pray, okay? Father, we just love you. You're our Father. You're our Daddy. You have brought us into life. And when we were younger, we just wanted you to do everything for us and bless us. But as we start to mature, our eyes get off of ourself and our hearts turn from just what we want to what you want. 
and how it can bless others. And so, Father, not for us, but for others, put these seeds within us and bring forth fruit. One plants and one waters, but God, we ask you, give the increase of Christ. He must increase. We must decrease. You are the one who gives that increase. And so our, our words are not sufficient our mind sometimes get in our, get in our way. Sometimes our emotions get in our way. But Father, our heart cries out and we long after you and we want to hear from you and we want to be with you and we want to be flooded over with your reality. We want to be saturated like a dry sponge. We want to become sopping wet and full of, of your reality so that it drips off of us. And it does it for others and it glorifies you and you see Jesus. And, you're, and from it you're honored because you see your son. So Father, we pray one for another also. That this will help, that this will be a seed, that this will be life and not words, not a class, not a... But Lord, it'll be the answer to everything that we've wanted all the classes all of the times that we gather that they'll not just be classes they'll be answers to prayer and answers to hunger and answers to longing that we have going off in us so father not by might nor by power but by your spirit saith the lord in jesus name Amen.